Good evening. It's Bob Wollier with the Situate Art Association and Let's Paint Situate. And tonight we're doing portraits. Something different than being outside doing a plein air. We're inside. It's January. It's cold out. So let's take advantage of studio work. This is part of the Wednesday evening portrait sessions we have. It runs every second Wednesday. The public is welcome. Come on down here to the Ellis House, 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, and work on a portrait. Whether you're novice or you're inexperienced, you're always welcome here. Tonight is going to be unique because we're going to have three or four artists. And what's really interesting about this is how each artist has their own perspective on how they approach a painting. Not only approaching the painting, but basically the same subject material. So you can see how each artist interprets their idea of the subject material. Here tonight's subject material is the lovely Kate from South Street Gallery, and she's going to be sitting nice and still for us, and nice and quietly, so we can capture her image. Uh, next to me is Scott Ketchum. Uh, he's a professor at Massasoit College, and he's got his own studio in Rockland, and he'll, he's got a fascinating approach to his work as well. And we'll close up on him, and he'll be explaining his technique and his insight of his painting. Okay, as you can see, we have a blank canvas tonight. Uh, we're going to momentarily start painting. Uh, Scott's got a blank canvas as well. He'll start painting, and hopefully we can capture the beginning and the foundation of the painting. Many times, those first five minutes, the first ten minutes, are the important part of the painting. I mean, it's basically, you don't want to build on mistakes. So what you do is you ensure that your foundation is right and you're going in the right direction. Okay, let's paint. Well, I'm working on a little bit different um, substrate, which is a, sort of a plastic sheet that takes the paint a little different. So I have to get a lot of paint on before I can take it off. Now what I'm going to do is, just like my plan here, is I like to put in a wash first. I'm using kind of a, a little bit of a green reddish wash because uh, the red and the green kind of look at a nice foundation for the skin tone, especially the green, it just kind of builds some pinks up on it. Now, we, you've seen me do this before. Like I said, it helps you with the pet canvas. Unlike Scott, I am working on just a simple 12 by 16 canvas. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at our model and I'm going to use maybe a little red. I'm going to probably, I usually kind of outline or kind of cartoon the painting first. Obviously, um, the face is basically kind of an oval, okay? I want to take advantage of her neckline also. And her hands aren't quite in the painting. But one of the things we've got to remember, that's a very simple rule with portraits, is basically all faces are basically the same. That's why we have face recognition. We'll set up a center line in that oval. She's a little off center for me. So I'm going to split this oval in half, basically up and down. Okay, and the eyes are basically halfway down this egg shape. Nose splits that difference. Okay, mouth splits that difference. Eyes, pupils, they're usually about one eye apart. You can start really start doing a lot of geometry on this almost. Okay, and then we got a hairline. She's got her hair covering her forehead pretty much. That means less flesh to do. Okay. And I'm working very light for a start. And she's got a neckline that goes down like that, her shoulders. And uh, then I might even do things like we have a really strong light on her. If you really squint down at her, she's basically two values almost. Okay, so we can actually wipe a little of this out and we can start seeing even the first bit of the shape coming through here. And then maybe what I'll do is bring in my darks, which is a red alizarin. I even actually use a little purple. I'm a purple fan. We're we'll doing the shades. Why don't you go over and take a look at Scott, see how Scott's doing. Look at him, he's flying already. Um, 
mostly at this point, I have all the things that Bob has been talking about, I'm totally approved of. My, my students at Massasoit were to see me now, they'd probably freak out because I'm in a way kind of flying ahead of all the things that Bob is thinking. But all those things that he's talking about are kind of intuitive at this point. They're in my head, they're in my mind. At this point, I'm trying to get some paint on there, I'm trying to get the feel of her shape, the basic shape, the shape of her face, the shape of the hair, which is beautiful shapes. What is it that makes, what, what is the music in a way of her shape? It's the beauty of it. You try to look for that before I look really for too many specifics. So it's very uh, non-specific at this point, very you know, kind of freewheeling. And I'm getting a lot of paint on there. I'm working on a, uh, in, in a way where I can take paint off as easily as I can put it on. So in a way, I kind of just go for broke, just get this stuff on there. Figuring about where I'm going to put her, where is that shape? We've got this beautiful light shape right there in the cheek, in front of the face. And we get, it's framed by this beautiful shape of the hair. And then this background shape, which is just sort of there. The shape of the neckline is also kind of works with that shape. And it makes this beautiful S shape that runs right through the design. Um, so that's pretty much where I'm at. Just trying to do it. A lot of it's now intuitive. Getting some stuff on there. And I'm mostly, I'm having fun. Right now, I'm still kind of just putting in some accents to kind of see where I'm going. A couple of strong darks, especially like around the jawline, around her neckline with her hair there. Get the eyes. I want to make sure I don't get too, too large with those eyes. But, and then I'm going to still put in a little, I put in my shade on the back side. And I usually like to use my darks as relatively thin and transparent. Okay, it's the darks don't have to necessarily really thick, heavy paint. They just nice little dark in there. Get that the crease of the nose, so to speak. You also notice when we look at Kate, there's a lot of reflected light on that on her dark side, on her right side. I still want to put my darks in, and I'll come back and define her jawline and her temple and stuff like that with the light. And you remember this from the Plan Air. So, I may even actually in this case just wipe it out for the time being. Put that down. perfect, but what it is, is still, we're still kind of dancing around the canvas. This is the first break. We usually go 20 minutes and then like a five minute break. And I always tell the model, don't, don't start judging it yet. It's way too early. John Singer Sargent used to put a spot of red, bright red paint on the nose just to distract the sitters, who were all rich Bostonians who knew everything, of course. And they would see something that looked like that, and they would probably wonder what the hell they were spending all their money on. And of course, at the last sitting, he would paint it out. So part of portraiture for hire is to deal with people's egos. But we don't have to worry about Kate's ego, because we're paying her. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things about doing portrait work, too, is it's a real test because either you have it or you don't. And, um, and I'm not saying necessarily the lightness. It's just how you capture the essence of the person and created a beautiful design, so to speak, or a beautiful representation of your subject. One of the things I'm not a big fan of, 
sometimes I see these, or, and they're done well, but I see people many times, you know, buy these portraits, and what they've done is taken the high school portrait photograph from the high school, give it to an oil painter, and then they paint a picture of a high school portrait. And it looks like a high school portrait, except it's a paint now. To me, that's like, why bother? Okay? And um, I think one of the things about having a nice portrait or any good painting is the fact that you have a painterly aspect to it. That's what, that's what you're buying. That's what you want. I'm going to put a little background color in this now, just to, just to start setting up so I can get my values correct. We've got kind of a neutral ochre color in the background. I usually bring my stand and I set that up because otherwise I'd have the window frame behind her, I'd have some painting frames behind her and it would just get way too confusing. So I always bring the stand, that's nothing but a painter's cloth behind her. Or you could, if we, I had a blue tarp, sometimes we use blue. It's, it's, you just want kind of a nice clean bathroom. Scott will probably have his painting done in two sessions. It may not be good, but I'm fast. <laughs> tone so that I can come back later and do darks and my lights and I mean Kate do you consider yourself a blonde? Yes. Okay but as you can see it's not like yellow or something like that it's also reflecting a lot of the light that's around it Usually, many times when you do a person with like a, a brunette or a really dark hair, it's interesting because they get very sharp highlights that are basically almost blue because of the light. opportunity to come sit for us we actually do pay for a model isn't that great or sometimes you may get the painting okay we've done that before too just exchange for the painting so it's a good way for you to get a painting of yourself I've sat myself a couple times my wife has sat and we're very proud owners of a number of paintings myself I bought so far, four of Scott's paintings. We probably have one in our house. <laughs> Believe it or not, I bought three for my son's house, and they look totally awesome in the house. Scott's work is just, as you can see, it's being built up. It just, it's very, very unique. Whereas something like my my painting is is more of kind of capture it for the so to speak, the participant. We got some nice red in her cheeks. So I'll put a little red in there, a little red and just white. It's basically just a pink. I'm gonna start off with a pink just to see where I'm going, a little dab of color. 
as we fall into the base of our of our jawline, I'm going to go a little more neutral with a little green mixed in just to kind of kill that pink. I don't want to give her a five o'clock shadow though. I don't think she'd appreciate that. Make her look like Brutus, yeah. <laughs> We also have a few strong highlights. She's got a real hot reflection on her cheek right now, but I'm not going to work on that. But a lot of times, and after doing this for years with a light such as it is, you find out that almost the widest light is right at the corner of her eyes and the bridge of her nose, right in there. Okay? Again, I'm just kind of putting notes down right now. But as these notes go down, it's slowly building the structure of her face. I think one of the things you gotta keep in mind when you're doing any kind of art, and it's actually part of the fun of doing art, is to stay flexible. Now, for instance, I just moved Kate's eye up a little bit because I just think it's much too low. So there's a certain flexibility. There's a lot of adjustments that take place, you know. I've never painted Kate. I know Kate, but I've never painted her before. So in a way, I have to kind of discover, you know, where all these things are. There's a standard, you know, there are some expectations in our that are sort of standard, but then you start to discover the individuality of the person. And you have to stay flexible. You have to be willing to change and adjust your painting as you go. So moving the eye, hopefully it, it was a smart thing to do. I'm, I'm not sure. We'll see if, I, if I've done good or not. We're going to break in about three or four minutes for our model to get a rest. That's part of union dues. Our union, anyhow. We'll sit down and relax for a bit. Gives us a chance to re-look at our painting from a distance. I mean, theoretically, one of the things I should be doing is stepping back now and then and taking a look. As you can see, I don't concentrate on one area. I, I jump around. I do a little bit of the nose, I put the cheek, I'm going to do a little bit of the hair now. I'm not going to just um, start with the eye and work out. Although I have actually seen artists that literally almost like, they start with the eye and they just almost paint it incomplete and then they just slowly work out. It's totally amazing it's th that people can do that. Something I certainly can't do. I do that. Does Kate do that? Or? Mm -hmm. I do. I paint like that. Well, we'll have to have Kate, Kate paint for us then. <laughs> Kate does some very nice work herself. She's had a couple of awards herself too, so that's great. I'm keeping my brush nice and loose. She's got a nice wave to her hair, so I want to make sure I capture that. I'm probably going to accentuate that, so to speak. I don't want to get. I don't want to work too much on this line here. Okay, but we'll give a little indication. We have a little reflected light under the nose. Now as I tighten up, as my old stick comes out, if you remember the stick from the blonde air paintings. A 
you know, the right nostril. I gotta make sure that everything's in line. Now I'm looking at this and I can see that eye over here is too high because that was, really that was my first go round with the eye. So I need to, this one I'm happy with, let's soften that line right now before it starts throwing me too much. That's almost too white now, but we'll fix that later. Okay, I got an eye here. I want to pretty much go over here. It's interesting because We all go through passport lines now, and it's all visual recognition, camera recognition. The reason they don't want you to smile, because what they're doing is they're basically just measuring all kinds of different points on the face in a very subtle aspect of that. Okay, we're back from break. One of the good things about a break, it lets you actually sit back Take a look at the painting from a distance and reanalyze it instead of being fo so focused on it. I'm looking at my painting now, and there's a couple things I want to correct. First off, I look at her now, she's actually kind of a pinhead, okay? So we need to correct that. And also, I think her face is just a little too wide here. But let me start with this up here, because it may not take much either. As you can see, it was just, hopefully, didn't need much more than just a couple little strokes right there, okay? Now, as I'm working here, I have Sebi Stravalovsky Stravalovsky sure. next to me. Olofsky. He joined us, and he'll be uh, showing us his approach also. And he's working in oils tonight. Okay, just got a nice bone structure here. I still look a little wide, but maybe what I need to do is just kind of bring that cheekbone in a little bit. It doesn't take much sometimes. The thing is, is uh, as Connie Pratt used to say, is a very well-known portrait artist from South Shore. Don't work on your mistakes. Don't build on your mistakes. Don't be afraid to change. You may find out But the whole thing is a mess. There's been nights that I've done work like this and I've completely wiped out the whole painting. An hour into it, an hour and a half into it. But then what I try and do is just say, okay, I got a half an hour left. See what you can do in a half an hour. And a hundred times it comes out great. As a reminder, I want to also say again, we're here every second Wednesday of the month. We have a, a model for portraits or figure, full figure, dressed figure. It's only $10 for members, $15 for non-members. It's such a deal. Three hours. Okay? And I'm going to switch over. Maybe we can introduce Sevi to you. And his. we can watch him as he starts his composition. Good evening. Uh, I got here late, and so I'm just starting in. But uh, what I want to do is the whole figure in a space. So that it's uh, the gesture, the figure, the personality. And I'm just going to broadly uh, sketch in the, uh, the lines, the dynamics of Kate sitting there so beautifully in her, in her chair with her great poise and personality. But I'm not going to be doing a portrait. It's going to be a, a figure study, uh, just the, uh, the lines of her uh, her uh, arms, her limbs, the way her head sits on top of it all, the way the legs carry uh, out of the picture. What I'm trying to do is uh, a composition, really, so that uh, instead of doing a figure uh, in the middle of a, uh, a panel, I'm I'm trying to make something that fills the whole uh, panel shape and carries the uh, 
the eye from one side to the other, and Kate is really just a beautiful shape in the middle of that, and an excuse to uh, work with her planes and her lines, uh, and it's a great, great treat to be here with you, Kate. Uh, anyways, let me spend a little more time getting this blocked out, and then uh, we'll start to get in some of the uh, the big areas first, using a big brush. Okay, you decided not to wear the striped, uh, no color tonight. It's just values and shapes, light and dark. That's good. Okay. It's a real treat for us to have Bob organize these, these get-togethers. We, we'd love to do it more, but the logistics of getting people together, a model uh, such as the, the, uh, the high standard that Kate sets here, and getting people out at night after a hard day's work. Uh, but we all we all work in other areas. I'm an architect. I love uh, structure. I love spaces. And so having a beautiful structure and a beautiful space like this is uh, it's architecture. It's all the same. It's all about shapes, relationships and shapes. I'm just dropping in her blouse right now to kind of get a little shape and value going here. A little contrast so that I don't go too light or too dark when I do her face. I got something to set her against. And as you can see, we're starting to, we're starting to actually get a little shape. We're starting to, we're starting to actually look like something now. And it's, a, it's a building problem. It's a building. Sometimes I start a painting, and, and I'm sure my neighbors here agree. It's kind of like, oh man, what, what, what am I into? This is especially like a complicated landscape, and you go, oh, there's so much happening here. How do I start? Where do I go? And you, you struggle, and all of a sudden you get to a certain distance in the painting, like you know, 30, 40 percent in, and you start really seeing it build. Okay and it's starting to really take shape. And then it's just kind of, it lands up being fine-tuning almost after that. Because you, you've now really got the foundation built. It's kind of building the uh, cellar first, you know? Well, not the cellar, but I mean, because we bounce around so much, but. shadow from the light on the left hand side and that will be kind of fun to just deepen in there a little bit so that it just gives a little dimension and I let the background fall into hair right now I want to make sure we keep that relatively soft. We don't want any helmet heads. And 
And I think I gotta straighten this eye out on the left side, otherwise I'm gonna start getting in trouble. How you doing over there, Scott? All right? I'm doing okay. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to go with this thing. I'm moving around, moving back and forth with the background. Should I make it lighter? Make it lighter, make it darker. One common misconception people have is that backgrounds aren't important, but they're hugely important. It's like the, you know, the, the music, what's going on underneath the lead singer is just as important as what the lead singer is doing. If that's a mess. The whole ensemble will be a mess. The way I look at it is I'm creating an ensemble of shapes and colors that have meaning, hopefully, um, if I get it right. And it's not, I can't neglect any one part of that ensemble. So I don't just do, wait until do the background later. The background is when she lights up against that background, and that's one of the things that I want to have happen in my, in my piece here. So, I've been playing with that. I mean, it doesn't mean you always go dark with the background either. You have choices. And right now I'm sort of going through my choices and going back and forth and going into that space of saying, okay, where am I going to do? Also because, you know, Kate's a fabulous model and she got right back into the pose. Nonetheless, little things do, you, you know, a little hair here, a little, you know, there's a little bit of a light on the neck I didn't see before. Maybe I didn't see it, or maybe it wasn't there, I don't care. I'm going to use it now, kind of like it. Kind of cool in color, I'm going to use it. So it's kind of fun to work with living people as opposed to photographs, which of course never change. Okay, I've been working on a little bit on the dark side here. As we can see on Kate, she's got a lot of reflected light on her shadow side of her face, her right side of the face. So that little highlight here is going to define her jawline and her cheekline. One of the important things we've got to remember though is that highlight, even though it looks light against the shadow, it's certainly not the same value that's on the light side of her face. Okay? It's almost like this light is still darker than the lightest light on her, the darkest light on her light side. Does that make sense? I think so. So if I put a white over here, it would look ridiculous. So what we'll do is we just keep that nice and soft, and it's just kind of a hint on that. Just enough to show that there's a reflection. It's a pretty neutral reflection. If it was a blue background, I'd probably give her a little accent of blue, or an accent of green, depending on the color. It's still a little greenish yellow ochre. I'm going to just put a little green in it still. And she's got a little bit on her upper eyelid. Just, it almost ends abruptly too. And I gotta make sure I get this eye right. And I got this down a little too low. Well. Okay. And she's got a little smile, so I wanna make sure I turn the corners of her cheeks, her, her lips up. One of the problems that sometimes a model will have is that as they sit for a long period of time, their face relaxes, and the next thing you know, they're frowning. And you just say, well, they really aren't frowning, but that's just it's how they're all boring. Goes. Okay? We're boring. Yet at the same time, as I said earlier, you know, you're painting that high school picture. What do you want? Uh, a big smile with all these teeth showing? I don't know if I want that either. <clears throat> so let's turn up the corner a little bit. Just a little bit. It doesn't have to be much. There we go. Just that, even that little bit, I think, makes a difference. It's like Bob Ross putting a happy tree in his painting. The upper lip is much darker than the lower lip. triangle there. A 
Amy actually have a little reflective light on that upper lip too. And what I'm going to do is finish the definition of that lip by painting the lower lip. It's kind of like I almost dragged the color down a little too low. Now that's too hot. She's got too much of it. She's pouting a little too much. Like I said, it's back and forth. This is the beauty of working with oil paints. It's always nice and easy to correct. Uh, she's, she's a little too angry there. We'll fix this up. falls into a nice warm spot, nice hot spot on the edge right here. I always like to give a little extra little reflection. Keep that look nice and moist. We got a little little highlight of dark right underneath her lip. A little shadow there. Just a little touch. You don't want to get too dark. Dark. It's 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 not a mustache or anything like that. A little reflected light of orange in it. <laughs> and it blends into the light area just a touch. Yeah, I've been thinking of making her look like a bulldog. She's done some very nice bulldogs here. I want to make her look just as good as a bulldog. <laughs> She's got a pretty good line underneath her jaw here too, but I don't want to. I want to make sure that stays relatively soft. <coughs> Put on work on the neck. Almost the darkest dark on her shadow area is next to the light area where it breaks between the two, because after that we start getting a reflected light into the other side of her neck and her face, mm -hmm. just like on her face above. Make sure she's got a nice delicate neck. It's a little too light. Then we'll just go back into it. And we've got actually a little reflection. And I might exaggerate that. The reflection that's underneath her that's um, underneath her chin. And that's coming from her shirt and upper blouse. There. And that helps define, it's a little too strong, but it helps define, it helps define the chin. I think one of the things that people have to bear in mind is that we are not cameras. We interpret what we see. So it's not so much a question of just copying the model, though. I mean, we want to be faithful. I definitely want to get Kate onto this canvas here. I think she's cool. I think she's lovely. But in the end, it's really my interpretation that's on there. So you take some chances that things may not be right. And that's one of the reasons I keep pushing this thing around. Does it feel right? And I'm not sure. Uh, but it's not so much about that kind of, you know, necessarily a kind of exactitude. I think it's a kind of expression that I really look for. You know, it's a, it's a kind of a dance. Because the model is there. She's real and beautiful. And so you want to... Think about that, but at the same time, it's my painting. And 
That's the most important thing to me. So I'm thinking about what does it mean to me? What, well, how am I going to express myself with this? Even though I'm also looking at somebody and trying to, you know, steal something from her. But it's really my response to Kate more than it is my copying Kate. And I think that's the most important thing. Um, good model gives us something to respond to, and then it's up to me to do it. It's up to me to work with that and not just copy. Because otherwise, you know, a camera can do it. Well, actually, even a camera can struggle at that. My girlfriend was a, an opera singer. She was a color to her soprano. And she went for her 8 by 10 glossies back in the time when we did that with film photography. And uh, they took about 350 pictures, out of which about a dozen were good. Some didn't even look like her. And then, of course, there was one or two that they actually used. So if photography is not exactly, you know, it's still an interpretive art form. Some pictures look like you, some pictures look like somebody else. So I think that's why painting, even in this age of photography, painting continues to delight, continues to amaze painters. Because it's not just a question of copying. I think, you know, painting went into sort of a tailspin when photography appeared. Painters said, well, if we're supposed to paint the world realistically and the camera can do it in a second, what are we doing? And they went into a, they, they came out of it very interestingly. Impressionism, expressionism, all these things appeared around that time as a response to say, okay, we're here to give an impression of sunrise, says Monet, when he does that famous painting that gave the the school its name. And artists, you know, painters started to go into a very different place for them. So, you know, that's still, that's really what I, what delights me. I look at Rembrandt, I look at all the great painters, and Rembrandt was certainly very real. Those people are very real after so many generations that they still feel them. But, at the same time, mainly, it's Rembrandt's vision. That's what really counts. That's why you see Rembrandt's in a museum and mine won't quite get there. <laughs> but I'm trying. How are we doing over the study? <clears throat> I think that uh, Scott has touched on something that uh, is really what the the art is kind of what what happens when uh, the viewer it's something that happens between the, in this case the painting and the viewer it's a response and no matter what uh, what style what uh, ism. The art is, uh, if you can reach people and elicit that response, uh, and people can say, you know, that's, that's how I feel when I'm in that, that kind of space, or that, that's a shape, that's a, a light quality, that's a mood that means something to me. And successful art has to be universal, has to reach uh, a number of people, and, and when it becomes just an investment tool, uh, it's 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 like Bitcoin. It's the you know the highest the highest bidder. There's a, a whole investment in a high level art market that really has little to do with what we're talking about. Uh, and you know there are very few artists that are, are able to get into that market, and a lot of them feel <clears throat> manipulated by it, uh, there's a uh, kind of a, you know a lot of money chasing after 
artists that like to see them become a big name. Uh, they go into the art schools, the MFA programs, and, uh, and find uh, students that they then take and promote. And so there's exploitation in the market. So it's really not about, about a uh, trying to pump up a price tag on, on your paintings. So the painting is something that's first of all done for you, second of all for your colleagues, and third of all for the public. And often uh, a, painting is, uh, a painter's work is not something that's uh, appreciated uh, until after his or her lifetime. It's not something you can count on. I mean, there are a number of related ways to art that uh, have more predictable income, whether it's uh, 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 graphics, uh, architecture, uh, you know, being uh, apprentices to mural painters. Uh, so if, if you're desperate to make a living in an art, other than teaching, uh, you're likely going to have to find a, uh, a sort of uh, adjunct to it that makes you feel creative. And you could go into the whole discussion of what, what is satisfyingly creative, uh, but uh, you can feel creative just being making a difference to people, putting, you can be creative in, in social work, you can be creative no matter what you do, if, if you make a difference, uh, and you feel the impact of, of what you've done. And, uh, in, you know, a lot of people say, oh, architecture is one if you get to design a lot of <coughs> beautiful buildings, and they get published, and they last for a long time, but the fact is, most people in the architectural business don't have that opportunity. There's a business and there's a practice. So uh, with painting also, there are ways to uh, fit into an existing market, but it's probably not going to be the, the way that uh, you uh, idealize what being an artist is. Well, we're back from a break. We'll probably work for another 10 or 15 minutes, at least with the camera crew. Uh, a lot of times you really don't necessarily finish in a three-hour session and you take it home, you may uh, spark it up a bit, you may take a photograph to use it for reference. But what I try and do, and what most of us try to do, is capture the essence still in that three hours and then just leave it. There's a spontaneity that happens when you, when you work under a time constraint, so to speak, and um, actually you come up with some very nice what I call looser work. Um, well, we've got a moment here before I go back into my painting. As you can see, we're, 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 we're still taking shape. I think I want to work on our hair some more, and that will bring the face out. Uh, but we'll get that for a moment. I want to go look at Sevi's over here. This is really exciting. And what I really like what's going on here, Sevi, you can comment if I'm on. There's this beautiful gray blue that's working off this sienna brownish colors. The, uh, I think the color, the color value, the chroma of this is just totally excellent. Of course, the composition works nicely. He's run his, he's run the feet off the bottom of the canvas. Her feet aren't necessary, but what this does is it kind of helps contain. It doesn't contain the uh, the figure, but makes sure that the whole canvas is being used, even to the point where he's run a little bit of her hairline off the top. And uh, it's a really nice cropping, I think. And I love just the wash on this. And if I know what you're doing in the setting, you probably won't even touch this anymore, right? Who knows, huh? Who knows? Yeah. But uh, you know, the, the structure of it is to make, nice. a, to make a almost a, a very solid base. I mean, she's seated. She has fantastic posture. The chair <laughs> is very solid. And the chair and the legs and the shadow all uh, create uh, a diagonal which gives it a lot of stability and one of the, the problems often with a figure painting or portrait is that it kind of floats uh, in something with a lot of border around it all around the kind of halo around it and so tying the shapes and the lines to the edge uh, and even deciding where on the edge you're going to 
connect it. Uh, you don't want to go right to the corner. There's sort of a, you know, you think about, these are negative spaces, and they're very important shapes, and no two are alike. Uh, so that, that, you see, that shape uh, is very different from that shape. And she is somewhat off center, but her leg is over here and ties that uh, structure back to the uh, other side of the uh, handle so that uh, it has a stability and uh, it, it you know, looks like it's sort of fit into the into the panel. And one of the things that you can almost define that, that a painting composition is about shapes, about the relationship between shapes, and about the relationship of those shapes to the edge of the canvas. You can almost define composition that way. So you see all these are, are definitely thought out uh, shapes. They're not just sort of uh, borders left uh, to the background. And I've, for the moment, uh, I don't know how much I'm going to get into the, the face. As I say, it wasn't a portrait, uh, but I think I might spend a little time on that. Probably won't do too much more with the with the figure. Pick up a little of the reflected light to get. Uh, you see, it's interesting because we have a light source up here uh, hitting her, but there's also a light coming off the background. Uh, on her arm and her upper torso, and they pick up a little of that. But the, the, seeing the way light defines the form is, a, I mean, a figure is really not that different than a landscape. It's planes, it's the relationship of those planes to the light source, and the more it's uh, uh, oblique, uh, angled from the light source, the darker it gets and the more directly it's uh, in the path of the light source, the brighter it is. So you can sort of, even if you don't see those things right away, you can start to look for them. Look for direct light, reflected light, and the way light changes as it goes around a form. Let's go over and take a look at the house costume. Thank you, Sebi. Scott, I know we during the break we were talking about <clears throat> you were you seem to be getting near a conclusion, but at the same time you said, let me play with it some more. And you mentioned that the background maybe needed some work. So right. here we go, we've got a nice interesting shape going here. We got a little lighter color now. I think that brings the face out to be honest. It really does, yeah. I'll let you take it in, from here. Well, in, in a way I'm telling a lie here, the, the, the shadow that the color here, you could see right there on the camera that it's darker here, and I tried to make it, and I tried to work with it, and it didn't work, and I was losing that other side of her face, which is beautiful, and I was losing it. So I said, all right, maybe I have to come in here, and I'm using a, a very unorthodox material here. I'm using, this is oil, oil paint, which is, of course, very orthodox, but I'm using it on a, um, a mylar-like sheet, which is called Denrol which is actually um, really more for designers than it is for painters, though it's fine to work for, for painters. And I'm actually taking a window washing squeegee and lifting a lot of it off. So a lot of this is subtracted. Or I'm just taking the squeegee and I'm changing some textures, beautiful texture to her hair, and I want to get that. Um, so uh, I don't care if it's finished or not, some of my favorite paintings by the great painters are their unfinished works, in fact. Um, though I don't really worry about, you know, finishing it so-called. And usually, you know, I'll, I'll let it be. It's a happening. It was a happening with something that happened in this moment in time here, right in this space. I'll let it be what it be uh, without fussing with it too much uh, afterwards. And Another thing I just want to say to people just in general, the painter Monet used to tell students, paint as long as you can without worrying if you're any good. Don't worry if you're any good. And if you don't worry you're any good, ironically, you'll get better than if you worry about being good. 
really what, what happens when people worry about being good is they'll take just kind of shortcuts and they'll do things to sort of um, reassure themselves that they're good, but they're not really strong. Um, they don't really make strong artistic statements. They just have to play it safe. If you really want to be good, don't play it safe. Take a chance. Like I took a chance. I had a painting that was okay. I kind of liked it. And here I am in front of cameras and everything like that. And I don't want to screw that up. But I had to beat it up in order to be happy with it. I had to take a part of my painting and actually reduce it to a less lesser stage of finish so that I could get a little bit further, a little bit more of what I wanted from this painting, what I want from any kind of a painting. So don't worry if you're any good. That's the, about, that's the, about the least important thing to worry about, is it any good or not. And who knows what good is? All those definitions about what good, what's good and what is bad is meaning have been challenged all throughout the 20th century. They continue to be challenged in the 21st century. There's never a central authority on art. There's never a person who can say, there's no Supreme Court that can say, this is the way it is. There are always people who differ, and sometimes history proves that those people are right. So don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. Mostly, be passionate, throw yourself into it. Learn some things from somebody, and then just go for it. But I'm much happier with this painting now that I disrupted it, actually. I did try to disrupt things, and I'm, I'm glad I did. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I, I go, uh-oh. I'm kind of glad I did, because I got that beautiful side of her face that I was kind of losing. Thank you, Scott. I'm a little more of a traditional here with my portrait. I'm doing really a <clears throat> kind of a straight portrait. And we're getting there. Um, again, i got to sit back and look at it. I'm trying to keep the hair nice and, and, and feathery. Um, kind of blending it into the background. I'm not too concerned about every little curl or every little wave. I just want to get the, uh, the feeling of her hair and the value and the, uh, the darkness up here so that it makes her head kind of roll, so to speak. Got a nice little accent in there. And actually it's casting a shadow on her face which is fun, or I got a little bit of shadow there. And it's a little reddish purple, so to speak. So I want to put the card in there. And I can even help, that even helps the curva, curvature of her, her cheek in there. Then we're dancing around couple things I still want to do. Am I going to finish this tonight? I don't know. But uh, we'll get a good start at it. A little bit of nostril, just a little bit. Up too, too low. So you can see her nose went crooked. We'll have to fix that. This the beauty of oil is, is uh, relatively easy fixes. Actually, that nostril is just too dark, period. So I'm just going to take my paper towel, just give it a dab, and I'll probably have to do that over again. And I still don't think that upper lip is dark enough, too. It's not separating itself from the lower lip enough. So we'll darken that up a little bit, too. In case you want to know, we're right here in North Sichuan at the studio, which is the Ellis House Studio, which is on 709 Country Way, which is probably a quarter of a mile before we get into North Sichuan Village. You're headed toward North Sichuan Village from the library beyond your left. Um, it's up the road about a quarter of a mile 
I feel like you're going in the deep woods or something like that, but once you get here, you'll find a uh, very nice Victorian historic house, uh, which is the Citroën Art Association's workshop area and, and main um, meeting area and, and, and exhibit area a lot of times also. Um, again, you can join us on the second Wednesday of the month, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Members is $10, non-members is $15. Anyone's invited, any medium is invited. Many times we have pastel artists here, besides oil painters. Many times we have watercolorists. We've had people just come up here and just draw with charcoal, and they might do three or four in an evening. They bounce around. It is just one sitting. It's a three hour sitting with our model. And um, that's, that's pretty much it. The, uh, it's posted usually on the Citroën website, which is www.citroenart.com. It's sometimes listed on Facebook. Um, I send out an email. It's kind of select right now, but if, if you ever wanted to get through to me so that you could be included on the email, easiest way to get through to me for this is info at situateart.com. That's info at situateart.com. That comes automatically to me and the president, Janet Canaccio. And uh, we'd love to have you join us. And uh, I think that's it for about this week. And hopefully we'll see you again. And remember, keep painting.